does it ever like kind of come out to you that maybe the solutions that we need are really deeply radical in that the way that we have to really deal with this widespread issue of anxiety and depression in, in American society or British society or, or Western society more generally, Western civilization more generally, is that there needs to be a radical restructuring of our economic system, our social systems, and our value systems? Well, I try to be guided by what the best experts say about this. And the World Health Organization is the leading medical body in the world. Um, and they said, mental health is produced socially. It's a social indicator. It needs social as well as individual solutions. And at first when I read that, I thought, I wasn't entirely sure I understood what it meant. And I kept looking at, for example, the UN's leading doctor on these questions said last year for World Health Day, we needed to talk less about chemical imbalances, more about power imbalances. And it was I kind of, although I had been trained in the social sciences, it seemed so, bear in mind that story I was told was so heavily biological. I was very committed to this heavily biological story about depression. When you've got a story about your pain, even when that story doesn't work very well, it kind of structures your distress. It structures your pain. It's like putting a leash on a wild animal. At least you know where it is. I was very reluctant to screw with that story. But the more I learned, the more I realized that the story I was telling was just way too simplistic. It's not that it's totally false. So there are three kinds of cause of depression and anxiety. Pretty much all scientists agree on this. There are biological causes, which are very real, things like your genes. There are real brain changes, although I don't think they should be characterized as a chemical imbalance for reasons we can talk about. There are psychological causes, which are how you feel about yourself. And there are social causes, which are how we live together. And all three of them are real and all three need to be dealt with. We need to stop telling a simplistic story and start telling a complex story. But it's only when you understand the more complex picture that you begin to find more meaningful solutions, which is not to say the solutions that are currently offered, chemical antidepressants and a bit of therapy have no value. They have some value, but they're not solving the problem for most people. They're giving some relief to some people and they have some value, but they're not solving. The problem. So I'll give you a very concrete example. I'm glad you talked about Berlin. I'm happy to talk, tell that story to the listeners a bit more, but the, we are the loneliest society that has ever existed. There's a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have who you could call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, mm. the most common answer is none. Right? It's not the average, but the most common answer is none. Imagine what life is like if you have nobody to turn to when things go wrong, right? And I've been thinking a lot about this this week because one of the people who taught me most about this sadly died last week. A wonderful man called Professor John Cassiopo, who was at the University of Chicago, who I interviewed a lot, who was the leading expert in the world on loneliness. He showed lots of things. One of the things he demonstrated is that for human beings, being acutely lonely releases as much of the stress hormone cortisol as being punched in the face by a stranger. This is one of the worst things that can happen to us. And he explained to me, you know, why, why are we alive, right? Why do we exist? One of the reasons we exist is because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the animals they took down. They weren't faster than the animals they took down. They were much better at cooperating. They were much better at banding together into tribes. Just like bees need a hive, every human instinct is to form a tribe, right? And if you think about those circumstances where we evolved, if you were separated from the tribe, if you were lonely, you were depressed and anxious for a really good reason. You were about to die. You were in terrible danger, right? Those are the impulses we still have. And I was really interested to look at. So Professor Cassiopo proved very clearly that this is a big, this is one of the factors that increases depression and anxiety really significantly. And we know there's lots of evidence loneliness has increased. So it's interesting, well, what's the solution to that, right? What's the antidepressant for that problem? And one of the heroes of Lost Connections is a doctor here in London who pioneered an approach to this. So Sam Everington is a doctor in one of the poorest parts of London, in East London, where, I'm, where I lived for a long time. Um, though sadly, he was never my doctor. And Sam was really uncomfortable because like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants, but he had loads of patients coming to him who were really depressed and anxious. And, you know, he could just see that giving them chemical drugs alone wasn't solving their problem. It was giving some of them some relief, but it wasn't solving their problem. So he decided to pioneer a different approach. 
One day a woman came to him, who I later got to know called Lisa Cunningham. You know, Lisa had been shut away in her home with terrible depression and anxiety for seven years. And Sam said to her one day, you know, Lisa, I'll carry on giving you drugs, but I'm also going to prescribe something else. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the doctor's surgery that was known as Dog Shit Alley, which gives you a sense of what it was like, which is kind of scrub land where dogs would go and shit. And Sam said to her, what I'd like you to do is come in twice a week and with a group, and I'll turn out and support you. And with a group of other depressed and anxious people, I'd like you to turn Dog Shit Alley into something beautiful. The first time the group met, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety. But what she noticed is most of the time depressed and anxious people are basically only given spaces to go and talk about how depressed and anxious they are. But this group gave them a chance to talk about something else. They decided they were going to learn gardening. They started to put their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. There's lots of evidence that interacting with the natural world is a really powerful antidepressant. They, um, and, and another thing happened. As they got to know each other, they started to form a tribe. And they did what human beings do when we form tribes. They started to solve each other's problems. For example, there was one guy in the group who was sleeping on a public bus. Everyone else in the group was horrified. They were like, well, of course you're depressed if you're sleeping on the bus. They started lobbying the local authority to get him housed. It was the first time they'd done something for someone else in years. It made them feel great. And the way Lisa put it to me, as the gardens began to bloom, we began to bloom. There was a study in Norway of a very similar program that found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for a kind of obvious reason. It was dealing with the reasons why some of the reasons why they were so depressed and anxious in the first place, their disconnection from other people and their disconnection from the natural world. And everywhere I went in the world, I really, from Sydney to Sao Paulo to San Francisco, I really saw this. The most effective strategies for dealing with depression and anxiety were the ones that dealt with the reasons why people felt so bad in the first place. Not to say there's no value in chemical antidepressants. There's some value, but the most effective ones are the ones that deal with these deeper underlying reasons.